Good morning, Mr. Alan. Good morning. I'd like you to introduce yourself. I'm Alan Barber. I'm working uh, as specialized officer at Interpol uh, in the vehicle crime unit, and I'm coming from Belgium. Okay. Yeah, would like you to talk about the Interpol. What is Interpol? From our own continent, we want to give to more like what is Interpol? Brief history. To give the history yeah. of Interpol. Everybody's going to. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, Interpol is uh, is unique in in his uh, in the work in the support it's giving to everybody. It's the only international organization, police organization, who has a network like we have with 178 countries in the world. That's the first thing that we can offer to all the police in the world. It's to be in contact. It's the first thing that we can that we can do as Interpol. That's, um, I think, the main point and the main advantage of Interpol. Now, in the, um, Secretary, Gen in the Secretary General, here at the headquarters of this network, with uh, looking for all kind of information are available and to transmit them to the country who needs it and who can use it in order to trace criminal. Okay. Yeah, we'd like you to talk generally now on car thefts as it relates to your own office. and. How does the Interpol help, or how is the Interpol going to help to stem the uh, rate of car stolen across the nation? St mm, vehicle crime, because we call it vehicle crime, because to steal a car is the first step of a long criminal process before the car will be re-registered in another country. Um, vehicle crime is a global crime. And it's uh, from all, it's everywhere in the world, from one continent to another, within one country, within one region. It is, uh, there is approximately 3 million cars stolen. So when we are speaking now, each 20 seconds, there is a car stolen. So after the interview, there will be in the world a lot of cars already stolen. That's the first point or a first uh, information. So more than 3 million cars are stolen. And um, okay, some are recovered. So at the end of the year, we can say that annually 1.6, 1.7 seven car are not recovered, which are going into the criminal process and will will use a second hand car coming from Europe, coming from Asia, coming from America, coming from Africa. So the routes are very different, and uh, I have to say that the criminal they are very very well informed about what is the the request what is the demand of the market example you will have in in africa due to the geographical situation and also the situation uh, of the road and off-road there will be a bigger need of uh, four by four cars than a very nice limousine that cannot uh, uh, cannot that you cannot drive so that's the first thing. The second thing is um, it's worldwide and it's very easy to transport stolen cars from one region to another. You put it in a container or you put it in a big boat and you transfer it from Europe to Africa and especially uh, to West Africa. Or you transport it from uh, Nigeria to one of the border country. It's easy, it's, it's very difficult for the police forces to control this. And what, it, what makes our work more difficult is that at the end, there is somebody like you, like anybody who wants to buy a second hand car and is happy, uh, happy to in some other place, uh, but there is no document or forced, but he will buy it because it's cheaper. And we can say, okay, it's an innocent purchaser or okay, it's uh, he buy it in good faith, he bought it in good faith, but is also part of the criminal process because the difficult is uh, at the end there is somebody like you like anybody who wants to buy a second hand car and is ha ha uh, happy to uh, but there is no document or um, the, the, the door is forced but he will buy it because it's cheaper and we can say okay it's an in innocent purchaser or okay it's uh, he buy it in good faith he bought it in good faith but is also part of the criminal process because he left about the, 
benefit or the potential of African continents and also in Europe. And uh, we were wondering what's going on and why and so long. First um, preliminary remark it's that I didn't say before. Uh, what, what, what the criminals make a lot of benefit, 19 billion dollar a year, and it's directly connected to other type of crime, drug smuggling, trafficking human being, terrorism, because they use trafficking in vehicles just to make money and in order to have assets, to have enough money to develop the other kind of criminal activities or even official activities. So we had this huge problem and, uh, and first of all, it's one of the in uh, one of the southern African countries who contact us and say we have a tremendous problem here because we, uh, we had a lot of Jap luxurious Japanese car and we have difficulties to check them and uh, what can you do to help us? So what we have done in cooperation with uh, several countries we have discussed with Japan in order to get the information about stolen vehicles. What happens Japanese uh, colleague gave us the information about stolen vehicles. We put it in the database, and each week we had between 100 and 1,000 stolen vehicles car discovered in in South Africa. But two or three weeks after, what happens? No more in South Africa. So we had a big big problem. Where where are they going? They were going a little bit higher. I mean, if you look to uh, to the world map, and they were going to. Um, United Kingdom and there they intercept hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stolen Japanese car very very uh, very adapted and uh, we said okay so we we uh, in the, in the Interpol in um, in London in cooperation with the local forces in the around the seaports in uh, in Great Britain they made a lot of actions what happens the car going through Netherlands through Belgium and afterwards introduced in, in Great Britain with forged documents and so on. So they are, very, they are very quick to adapt themselves. So we develop, each time we develop more exchange of information, other type of information that stolen vehicles to know, registered vehicles, if it's a salvage vehicle and so on. What they did, the criminal from Japan working, it's organized crime from Japan working with some uh, Middle East uh, organized crime people, what they did, in or they avoid any kind of control by sending to Great Britain salvage vehicle. So we had again to adapt the databases, but only with the databases we were able to discover more than hundreds car a week, which is which is very important because it allow all our, uh, I would say, our representative in, in, in the world, we can help them directly by giving them access to the, the information and to trace, to monitor every day, every second what's going on. Interesting one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Minister of Justice, what can we do against it and so on? But I said, nothing. Our work as police, it's to, to f trace a criminal, mm -hmm. to recover the car, that afterwards it's finished it's it's the it's criminal it justice to take over yeah it, no it's not the criminal justice it's the civilian court to take it over because if you tell them the nigeria police says no it's now a civilian a civil thing they said no it no, 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 it depends. Mm. okay uh, i'm rolling on to yeah. yeah mr allen how can one avoid buying stolen car huh? make it stolen vehicle okay Right, again, go. How can one avoid buying stolen vehicles? I think there is a, you, you can copy, copy some, some system. I think Nigeria and all the region, uh, West African region, they would, they would have to think about um, and, and to learn maybe of experiences made uh, all over the world, I, I think America, but also in Southern African region. There, they have developed a certificate of clearance, and I think it's a very good idea to develop. It's something something uh, is, can be realized very easily it's before a car could be registered in a country like in uh, Nigeria or in Benin or whatever the car with paper has to go through the customs has to go through the vehicle registration and the NCB our representative Interpol sorry, our Interpol representative in, uh, in the country 
to cross check if the car is not stolen somewhere else so example the car your car is stolen in in um, in lagos and it's exported to benin and there the benin uh, authorities will control first the customs will control if everything is okay the vehicle uh, the vehicle registration will look if the car this car is not already registered in benin and 30 they will control via the ncb if the car is not stolen somewhere else and if on the paper it's written that it's coming from nigeria they will look if it's not stolen in nigeria and they can also look that's a must if the car is not also registered in nigeria in order to avoid that the car stolen will be directly registered in benin so this certificate of clearance in order to make the vehicle clear before you register it it's a good tool to avoid that your stolen car will be registered somewhere else okay so you would advise a nigerian government and um, other uh, paramilitary forces like the customs and the uh, registration we call them local government registration office to go through the ncb to ensure that cars are not stolen before they are registered officially i i will even even advise all the, the west african region and the nigerian authorities to look at it and to look at solution and we as interpol we don't have uh, a database and just a database but we can help with our knowledge uh, on vehicle crime and what happening in worldwide to give you the best tool and to give you the best advice in order to develop a good tool so we are there we have our database we are we have our knowledge and we advise you um, to try to find a solution in your region first in your country and in your region and we are ready to help Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like you to introduce yourself. Yes, certainly. My name is Hamish McCulloch, and I'm a specialised officer in the Trafficking of Human Beings branch within the Interpol General Secretariat. I'm actually a United Kingdom police officer, and I'm seconded here by the UK National Crime Intelligence Service, specifically um, in relation to um, matters affecting um, trafficking of human beings and crimes against children in particular. Okay. Yeah, we have a, a, a tradition. We'd like you to tell us what is an interval? Because local uh, local people don't really know. We we hear interval. Yeah. For, people, for somebody like me, I should know what is interval because of my own background. Yeah. But uh, millions of people back home don't know what is interval and the role of interval. So could you throw more yeah. that? I mean, it's perfectly true. Most people's perception of the organisation is a uh, um, superhuman policeman with um, superpowers who jet around the world fighting crime, which uh, um, isn't really true. It's glamorised in novels and the name is glamorised. But the reality is that Interpol exists to improve the uh, police cooperation um, to try and combat international crime and it was set up, um, as I'm sure you know, many years ago um, as a direct response to the increase in international crime and criminals crossing borders. And legislation in different countries has always caused problems. Um, it's what might be an offence in one country is not in another. So the organisation uh, was initially set up so that police officers could talk to each other about criminals who were crossing borders. It's developed from them into um, uh, an organization with 178 member states with a communication system for, which enables countries to uh, pass information um, to each other or to Leon or to a number of countries or to a region or to certain um, areas that just speak one particular language, for example, French or English speaking countries. Okay. Yeah. We are told you uh, the person, the director in charge of human trafficking. Um, we have on our hands back home in Nigeria a major, that's a major problem where our young girls, our children are exported to countries all over the world. I won't limit it to Europe now, they're taken all over the world. Mm -hmm. For child labor and um, um, 
prostitution, if I may use that word. Yeah. Um, with your experience, would like you to talk about that, and more questions will come up. Yeah. The, um, the problem, sadly, isn't just confined to Nigeria. It is actually a worldwide problem now. Um, but obviously, if I can focus on um, your particular part of the world and uh, how that fits in with the international increase in prostitution. Um, firstly, prostitution has been around forever um, and it's been there's many different ways that it's been tried to be combated, it's been legislated against, it's been legalised and at the current time um, some countries actually have legalised prostitution in itself and, and it's something which um, um, different countries depending on their, their laws and their traditions and how they actually um, approach what they call a problem um, is entirely up to an individual country. Um, our major concern and the concern of, of our department is children um, because people refer to child prostitutes and um, which is a wrong description. These are basically children who are being sexually abused and they are being uh, trafficked um, around the world for um, the basic um, methods of uh, making money by criminal organizations wanting to make money. So if I'm cutting, you said child, um, child abuse. Mm -hmm. Now what range, what age are you talking about? The age I think you have to uh, Again, depending on where you are and depending on demand and supply, um, children can be involved um, uh, or being exploited by adults um, as young as uh, eight, nine years of age. And if, if um, somebody has sufficient money in many countries they can buy a child of any age. Um, if I can refer very loosely to the internet, um, there are images of children being sexually abused on there who are no more than six weeks, three months old. So the whole spectrum of child abuse um, is undoubtedly available um, in um, the areas of prostitution. But um, what I would like to say is that the vast majority of children who are sexually abused are sexually abused by people they know and they trust and families and school teachers and that type of person. It is the minority of children who are trafficked outside of um, their countries to be sexually abused by um, others in a different environment. But however, it is a problem, it is a growing problem and um, we're only too aware of it and um, um, we have various um, forums which we approach that and uh, um, to try and assist again countries in um, developing new strategies and tactics to uh, prevent it, uh, prevent the abuse of the children and also to identify who they are and who the criminals are behind it. Yeah. Can we can we can we safely say that um, the, tri the uh, human trafficking um, um, crime now is on a global uh, is a cartel oh, in a global yeah. world? It's um, um, it is massive business. Um, there are, there are, we also deal with um, illegal immigration, clandestine immigration, and um, and they are t they are separate and distinct areas of criminology, of crime rather. And um, the, the, the main difference is that um, the person who is being trafficked as a legal immigrant wants to get to another country to start a new life. Um, the actual women and children, um, young women and children who are being trafficked for the um, sex industry, um, they, um, some know where they're going and why they're going, but many believe that they're going um, to um, work in totally different environments as waitresses, um, to work in hotels, to work in bars, um, to go as dancers and, and they believe that this is the reason they are actually moving countries to start a new life but the reality is it's very very different when they actually arrive in the destination point. Yeah, that takes me to another question now. Some three, four weeks ago we had some young girls who were innocent like you said 
uh, lured to travel. Mm -hmm. They would didn't have travel documents. All of these things were prepared for them by the trafficker, mm -hmm. who had told them that they were going to walk in the hotels or as nannies, uh, mm -hmm. and that um, they were actually being exported for a sex level. Yeah. And let me ask, what is the Interpol doing to stem this illicit business? The, um, I can first of all say that um, once um, girls arrive in a country, then the, the national laws of that country um, are the laws that the police in that particular country will look to, to either prosecute the traffickers or in certain circumstances um, um, they will prosecute the girls themselves uh, and they will conduct the criminal investigations. Now each country's laws are different. So what we're doing here, um, we have two distinct and separate forums. The first one is an Interpol specialist group on crimes against children um, and that meets twice a year and has been meeting for twice a year since 1993. Um, within that group we have um, a specific area which looks at child, uh, children who are being prostituted and uh, the sex tourist industry. And that group um, meets, as I said, twice a year. Nigeria are represented at uh, virtually every meeting. Um, they've presented papers at this meeting. And there are law enforcement officers, there's around about 100 different law enforcement officers from normally about 40 countries come together and to exchange experiences, best practice, to exchange information on what is actually happening at, uh, at that particular time, what are global trends, what are regional trends. So we facilitate that exchange of information and we facilitate a, f a stage where countries as Nigeria have done, can make a presentation to the rest of the world about what these are our problems, this is what assistance we would like, and that is taken from there. And the same representatives tend to come from the same countries. So this network group is built up all the time, and, um, and, and, and that's deemed to be very successful. The, the second group we have has only recently started, and that specialises specifically on the trafficking of women for the sex industry. So although there is an overlap of age with young girls to the, the um, slightly older women, um, then the, but that is totally focused on the sex industry, the criminal organizations behind it, and that meeting again um, is twice a year, and um, for the same purposes to exchange information what's currently happening in each country and also to exchange information on laws in countries and so officers can go back and put into uh, practice what they believe would be successful strategies in their own country. Okay. Um, let, let me ask this, we seem to be talking about delivery of papers, mm -hmm. coming conferences, has it helped to, to, to reduce this problem? The police can't reduce or control this problem at, in, on their own. Um, here at Interpol, within our group, we advocate um, a multi-agency, multidisciplinary um, responsibility. And it's a social and economical problem as well. Um, the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, young people um, who believe that they're going to be paid a good wage um, for doing a, a job um, of waitressing or a job of um, um, hostessing or the dancer, etc. Um, some jobs like that do exist, but very, very far and few between. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly, um, the, the, most of those positions are filled by local people from their own countries and they're not well paid uh, positions. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on where you are in the world, a salary in London is very attractive. It's a lot of money. But to live in London is very expensive. And people who are actually being paid a wage 
to work in a restaurant get paid very little money and it certainly um, um, doesn't pay enough to save up to send money home to, to get a glamour style and I think um, the one of the responsibilities is goes back to um, each country to for example an awareness campaign to even from a very young age within schools to say look this is the reality the reality is when you arrive in a country with no documents mm -hmm. you will lose um, any rights that you have the criminals who've arranged for you to move there will treat you very badly this is what really happens mm -hmm. and um, so that's that's one angle uh, another angle is the um, and it's um, it's the belief that um, um, well it can't be as bad as that some some girls know I'm entering the sex industry and uh, but they don't realize how many clients they need to serve what living conditions will be and they're, they're moved from London to Brussels to Amsterdam to Paris um, to uh, Germany um, and, and further afield across into Asia um, to America um, and it's it's wherever that supply is so wherever the demand is for a particular type of girl then the supply will follow and the criminals are well very well aware of that and human beings are being dealt with as a commercial commodity and that cannot be right and uh, but it, it's it's a crime that isn't tangible it's uh, if you steal a car then you have an item which costs somebody a lot of money if you go into a bank and uh, you extort money from a bank then it's something which is is measurable but human misery and suffering um, is something that um, is is not a tangible object and it's something which I think sometimes is is people put it to one side and also the, the average person doesn't really believe I don't think that this type of trade goes on to the extent it does um, yeah I'd, I'd like to ask you it takes two to tango the lady who's into commercial sex and uh, the clients we're only talking about the lady who is into commercial sex here are we also going to look at the angle of a man who goes to have sex with this lady Okay. Again, you've got to look at national laws, and as I said before, some laws legalize it. In most countries, um, actual, sorry, a lot of countries, prostitution is not illegal. The illegal, the offences are to solicit, to um, run a brothel, and the offences that surround the actual prostitution. But the the the, the problem is, uh, is it? it's not the girls it's not the women it's not the customers it's actually we look at the organized crime that's behind it and we look to disrupt the um, the organization methods and to um, try and coordinate action against the actual criminals who are facilitating the supply of the girls for the customer at the end of the line but different countries have a different approach and um, uh, we don't have an opinion on which is the best way which isn't the worst way because it would be wrong for us to try and influence um, different countries um, different opinions depending on culture on uh, background and it's the people's choice of the country and the governments of those countries who make those decisions okay. we, 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 I ran through the internet um, when we came and um, I saw one um, story about a man, Amos, that was recently arrested for human trafficking. I hear it's one of the big barons in this business. And one begins to wonder if we are aware, and the Sitoris here are aware of these barons. Because I've asked when the Italian police came to Nigeria, these ladies they get to Italy. Some people sponsor them to get to Italy to do these mm -hmm. things. And they are well known to these security people. Why, has, why are they not prosecuted? Why are they not taken to the court? Again, um, the, uh, if we go back to um, where we start at the beginning of where you need evidence to prosecute. Okay. 
Um, if somebody steals a car, somebody makes a complaint, that's it, straightforward. However, the trafficking offence, you need the evidence in the country of the prosecution from um, the victims. And I look at girls who are trafficked for the prostitution industry as victims of crime. Then I don't look at them as criminals, they're victims. And um, the um, and countries need to um, obtain evidence from these victims to take the traffickers to court to prosecute them. But there are many, many problems and uh, a lot of them are fear. The girls are scared to uh, go to court and make uh, statements and give evidence. Um, you also have a lot of the girls who are involved when they're abroad are actually um, re residing illegally so they have no right of residence um, and they're, um, the, the other problems they have are do they trust the police in that country where they're in? Because many of the girls from many countries have a different relationship with the police um, as in the countries where they're actually being uh, exploited. Now there is a, a new UN convention which has um, been published and uh, it was um, in uh, Palermo is where it was uh, under ratification and um, that sets out guidelines specifically relating to women should be tra treated as victims and government should look seriously at um, providing some sort of safeguards for girls who are, um, are being exploited through um, the sex industry and so that, and that possibly a right of residence um, a right of residence for a period of time, um, sort of witness protection is something which you've got to consider. But of course, that opens another argument saying if we grant girls right of residency, will they come and say, I'm being sexually exploited so they can get residency? And also, it opens the door for uh, a defence to say that uh, um, this girl is only saying that. Uh, this man uh, exploited her through the sex industry so she can have residency. So it's a very, very difficult um, situation. So it's um, law enforcement in different countries have different methods of obtaining evidence and, uh, and they're working hard. A lot of countries are working hard and uh, certainly within the European Union um, the presidency um, takes over, uh, Belgium take the presidency next and they have very, very high in their agenda the crimes against children, trafficking of human beings, um, and uh, Euro European governments are looking at this very, very seriously. Yeah. W would you suggest uh, in this uh, context that um, countries globally now should look at the law and do something to review the law to suit the problem that we have? Yeah. I think a lot of countries need to review their legislation because a lot of legislation was, was written a long time ago. It was written before um, people were travelling around the world uh, to the extent that they are now. Um, it was written before um, the internet was there where you could seek information on where to find prostitutes in a town, what's actually going on in other countries. And now people are so much more aware of, um, of what's actually happening. And I think um, countries need to continue review legislation and um, but to do that um, in consultation with law enforcement and other agencies as well because it's um, um, for example health have a very important role to play um, it's uh, in Africa um, as, as you well know and I'm sure your viewers will know AIDS is a massive problem in Africa and, and the AIDS problem um, is something which um, has got to be um, addressed through an education campaign. There are a lot of myths and taboos uh, and th that young children and young women need to know that these are myths and the taboos and believe that they're myths and they're not true stories. And uh, so there are, there are many other areas, it's education as I mentioned, there's health, there's the police, social services, but all of these within the countries um, cost money. And so it's, it's a social economical problems as well which affect um, the, the speed in which countries will actually react to this problem. Mm -hmm. And the problem isn't just to prosecute or try and prosecute children or young girls who are soliciting themselves. 
um, or just to prosecute um, the, the men who are actually going to have sex with the, the women. It's to legislate and educate and also to focus on those people who are facilitating the trafficking. But if there was no demand to leave a country, then nobody would want to go. So. This, let me ask you this question. Have you had to do with cases where ladies are subjected to having sex with animals? We had all sorts of stories. You are an expert in this field. Have you had to deal with such? Um, on an international basis, um, with um, the uh, internet um, exchange of information involving uh, what we call bestiality, um, sex between animals and people, and uh, videos, um, they do exist. Um, it's it's quite um, the in some countries again, um, um, it it it's it's legal. Other countries it's illegal, but it's only between countries where it is a criminal offence. And, and that's what um, the um, the areas we work in involving uh, sexual relationships between um, adults through whatever means they are. Um, we don't moralise, and a, a lot of people mix up particularly um, prostitution involving adults. They get a moralistic view, and the morals of whether prostitution is right or wrong um, is something which um, we don't take a view on. One thing, um, sex with children is sexual abuse, and uh, children cannot consent. And um, the um, and anything else beyond that, then we don't look at a moralistic view. If it's an offence in a country and it's an offence in another country, and they want our assistance, we'll assist them. Okay. Why ask this question? You talked about AIDS, mm -hmm. and like you said, AIDS is a problem that is ravaging in Africa now. And from my own uh, background. We see it as for oh, most of the, these girls who come into Europe to have all this because of the morals, because of the culture mm -hmm. that we have back home. We see it as perhaps they would have gotten all of these diseases from having sex with all sorts, human and animal. And for every girl that is deported back to Nigeria, the Nigeria police first took it upon themselves to let them to go pass them through eight tests. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have five out of ten. You have six out of ten, you have two out of ten. And we're beginning to wonder if the stories we're told has to do with them sleeping with animals or human beings. I'm not a medical person, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think... Uh, my knowledge of AIDS is it's, it's passed by uh, blood contact and body fluid contact. Um, so I'm not really the best person to ask that question of. I think if you, you find uh, a, a, a medical doctor who's an expert in that, they'll probably answer those questions for you perfectly uh, well. Now, would you, would you have an advice for young ladies who think that um, coming abroad is a greener posture to make a living? Yeah. Um, firstly, it's, it sounds very attractive when somebody offers you um, a flight or a trip by car or by boat across to... Um, to somewhere in Europe or North America or somewhere exotic uh, and they're offering you a job then first of all um, question is there a job really and uh, and the reality is that, that to stay with their family where they are and try and create a life and a home and work within their own country if there is an offer of an employment then make sure that if they are traveling one if somebody's offering them a job without the proper documents then it's not a proper job uh, make sure that it exists that if you need visas you have visas um, and that somebody make contact with somebody in the country you're going to to make sure that they can go and see that the job actually exists and i don't think very many of them will but the reality is that um, girls arrive and they're kept in very, very uh, bad conditions, they're uh, given very little money and they're uh, put out on the streets or they work from small flats or very small rooms in multiple occupancy uh, brothels and um, they are made, they're forced to sleep with um, um, any man who comes through the door. Um, 
they're made to stand on street corners and look into cars and any man that stops in the car they need to have they have to have sex with them they can't refuse they can't choose because of the threats and the oppression from those controlling them and um, and the basic advice is that uh, what the, the job they think they're going to won't be there Deve create a life within your own country and uh, and it's uh, Stay with your family. Yeah, I sorry that I'm have to take you back. Hmm. Just a while ago, you said do threats from those controlling them. Mm -hmm. When these people are in a developed world, where they doesn't mean the police around that country do not know who these people are to fish fish them out and also deport them the way they also deport these young girls who are innocently tricked to do this business for them. Yeah. If um, Police in various countries, if they're aware of who's involved, they will undoubtedly be investigating them. But many of the people who are involved um, are nationals of that country. So it's not a matter of deporting them to, um, to the country of their origin because many of the criminals involved in organised crime in each country are nationals of that country. And then you need to get the evidence. And to get the evidence, you need the evidence from the girls and we get back to where we started, that's very difficult to get because it's um, a lot of occasions it's threats against um, the family back home as well. Um, the families are aware that their, their daughter has gone to work and they send a little bit of money back and a lot of it is, is shame. The children are ashamed of the fact that you know I've been conned, uh, I'm working this way but they write and say to their families I'm working in a restaurant and life's good and I have a boyfriend and it's a story to keep the family happy and if they don't work in the sex industry then their um, controllers say we will inform your family um, the, um, um, they're not from Nigeria another part of the world um, it's been documented that on arrival girls are forcibly raped and it's filmed and the threat is that the pictures will be sent back to their family if they don't work for them. So there are many different ways. And these, uh, the girls aren't kept under um, lock and key. It's not, it's not like an arrest in a prison. It's a mental detention, knowing that uh, they've, they're controlled mentally um, as to when to come and when to go and the money to provide. And another very common method, which I haven't mentioned yet, is the introduction of drugs. Um, they get introduced to heroin and it's free, try this, and yeah, lovely. But then it's not free after the, they're addicted and they have to pay for it. And to pay for it, they have to, have to work. And the only person they know how to, who to get it off is their supplier. And he's the same person as exploiting them. And um, so it's not, it's not a good lifestyle, it's not a pretty lifestyle. And it's not what it's uh, painted to be. Um, there's, there is a lot of money which is made, but the girls don't see it. It goes into the organised criminal uh, groups. Yeah, you, uh, well, I'd like you to do us a favour. Because of the economic problem that we have back home in Nigeria, young girls and men believe that to be a human being, to make a living, you have to get to Europe. We'd like you to talk straight into the camera by giving, uh, by way of advice. Not like you said before, not to believe all these things because it is not just easy to pick the dollars or pounds on the streets of the UK. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um. Many people think that working in Europe and North America and the richer countries in the world um, is an opportunity that must be taken with both hands if it's offered. The problem is that many of the jobs that you might see advertised as waitresses, as hostesses, as dancers, as babysitters, as childminders, they don't exist. If you're tempted to go, then make sure that you speak to your parents first and make sure that you get some evidence from the country you want to go that the job does exist and when you actually go and apply for visas to travel to those countries those people issuing the visas should make sure that the documents advertising the job and the person 
who is actually paying the money at the end of the day really exists because in reality there are very very few jobs like that that do exist for outsiders very very few indeed and my advice is to stay at home to work with your parents and to develop a career and a future within Nigeria there is no streets paved with gold in London Paris Brussels Dusseldorf or anywhere else in Europe or New York or Australia thank you Many of you will see jobs advertised in Europe and America and other developed parts of the world uh, offering good money to work within uh, restaurants or bars as dancers or as babysitters. The reality is that these jobs are advertising prostitution. They want girls to come and work as prostitutes in these parts of the world. The money they're offering you will not see you will get very little, you will find that you'll be imprisoned and you'll be unable to send money home and it will not be the job that they thought you were having. Stay at home, stay with your families and build a life in Nigeria and a future there. Thank you. Uh, do you ask a question? Yeah. I would like you to share your experiences in this uh, regards as it relates to e trafficking in human, child labor, and prostitution. Um, firstly, with, with child labor, um, we our involvement is purely with the criminal offense of the um, illegally um, facilitating the crossing of borders. Mm -hmm. So the actual labor um, and the work that the children do at the end of the line um, is we don't have a responsibility for because in many many countries um, they police that themselves many countries don't have laws uh, for ages of children who are working and that is a national problem dealt with nationally and UNICEF the United Nations um, <coughs> uh, children's organization they actually um, deal with that on an international basis um, with prostitution, um, it's uh, experiences wise uh, on an international field, um, you, can, you can see the increase so much and if I can just talk briefly about uh, um, a recent trip I just made across from France to Italy and um, into Eastern Europe and the, as you drive through Italy on the, um, the, the main roads other than the auto routes um, you see girls who are obviously of African origin um, standing uh, at the roadside uh, waving at cars and c with single men in uh, clearly prostituting themselves um, by the way they're dressed, their actions, their demeanour. And this is daylight hours, evening hours and it's something which um, not one girl or two girls but there are hundreds of them hundreds um, and I was um, recently uh, in Venice and I got the bus from Venice back to my hotel which was about uh, 20 kilometers outside of the town and um, the bus left at around about um, nine o'clock at night and there were seven um, black African girls who got on the bus who got off at different spots, at shopping centre car parks, at uh, crossroads, clearly for the purpose of prostituting themselves um, during the night. Mm. Now the risks that are involved there are unbelievable. First of all um, there is um, the, the risks of physical injury. You don't know who's going to stop. You don't know what language they speak. You don't know where they're going to take you you don't know what's going to happen and it is not a job that I'm sure any of any of these girls thought they were actually going to um, to, to, to do um, the uh, but there are many good things going on in the world as well for example there are quite a few countries have um, drop-in centers clinics where um, and they work very successfully where people recognize and accept 
there are girls who are on the streets offering themselves to prostitution. And they have centres where they can get free condoms, they get free advice on um, sex education, on sexually transmitted diseases, they can have uh, AIDS tests if they want. And as I mentioned, many of these girls have actually been introduced to drugs and they provide a needle exchanges so you can go and get clean needles because you can't turn a blind eye. You can't just say drugs don't exist because they do. And if girls are injecting themselves, if an age is so high, this is the prevention system again. And you can um, you get a clean needle for yourself. You don't pass it to somebody else or get somebody else's because that's a sure way of actually contracting AIDS. Is that encouraging them to get more into the trade? Um, I don't think so. I think it's facing up to the problem. And we have to face up to the fact that this problem exists, that um, there are hundreds and hundreds of young women being lured into the sex industry who are being persuaded to use drugs who were being forced to um, sell their bodies, who were being bought and sold as you would buy and sell fruit and vegetables. And, um, and they, they are victims, as I said before. And as victims, I think we need to uh, uh, provide the services so they can help themselves. Um, once you, you, you imagine leaving your country um, very excited about this new job, and then you realize that you're, you're forced into prostitution your self-esteem drops, you look for some sort of an escape and drugs are provided, there's your escape line. And uh, so it's, um, I think we should look at, at the victims and, and help the victims. And law enforcement will do what they can to prosecute those who are actually doing the, the facilitating and organizing the criminology, the crimes. And um, the uh, and other services need to do their bit to actually help girls who've slipped into it to get out of it and more importantly the education program needs to be there to prevent children entering into the um, sex industry so they know the truth of what's happened. Um, we, we quickly tell our children not to cross the road. We tell our children you know, that, um, to use a proper crossing that until they're a certain age and they know how to cross the road safely they don't do it. And But teaching children about the dangers of the sex trade and sex is something that um, is difficult for parents I think in many many countries to discuss. and it's yeah but it's got to be it's got to be faced up to and, 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 and discussed and they've got to be aware of the dangers and as the internet mm. increases the same applies there there is a lot of bad things on the internet but there's a tremendous amount of good stuff on the internet and it's the first place you look for information, it's the first place I look for information, and it's the first place children should look for information, and they should be encouraged. But they need to know the bad things, and there are a lot of bad things in there, not just pictures yeah. of sex. There are people in there trying to groom them, trying to persuade them to leave home, trying to befriend them, who are pretending to be somebody they aren't. And these are all areas that we need to educate children in so they're aware of what the dangers are. The same as the dangers of crossing a road. Um, the same as you don't go up to a dog you don't know and pat it because it might bite you. So they know that. <laughs> and they need to know about in the internet. You don't go up to the internet and just go blindly in because there's some bad things in there. And uh, so education is very important. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd like you to introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Nimal Mahagamage. Nimal is my first name, and Mahagamage is my family name. And I'm a drug law enforcement officer from Sri Lanka, and presently attached to the drugs uh, subdirectorate of uh, Interpol. Like I said, we have a tradition of um, asking officers here, what is Interpol, and what is the role of Interpol? I would say, in a, in a nutshell, Interpol is the link between uh, law enforcement agencies in uh, the member countries in assisting in law enforcement. 
and of course law enforcement means you know apprehension of criminals and uh, all the other rest uh, uh, other parts of it but interpol is the link where it where it is the go between between let's say there are two countries who are doing an investigation and interpol will step in so that with the facilities available here, especially our databases, Interpol can assist both countries and get them together. And to speak uh, a bit more on that, for example, where drug law enforcement is concerned, we uh, uh, place a lot of emphasis on working meetings. For example, if five or six countries are involved in one common drug trafficking group. What we do here at Interpol is we invite the investigators from these countries and we sit together here and we let them, let the investigators exchange whatever data they have and it comes you know, very, very handy for an international investigation. Okay. Thank you for that. Um that brief um, introduction of the Interpol. Now, we'll come to your department now, it has to do with drug and um, heroin. We, what, how does your department at the Interpol help to combat the crime of drug trafficking? Yes, again, it, okay, well, to, to be more practical, let's say there is a drug seizure in uh, Lagos right, by NDLEA and they, this agency will send us, send Interpol what we call a drug seizure message or a ST message through the Interpol branch in Lagos. And when we get that message, there are certain criteria that has to be included in the message like obviously the name, the date of birth of the person arrested, and the modus operandi and any telephone numbers that he would have had in his possession. So we, no sooner we get this message to the drug subdirectorate or to the what we call the MRRB, it, it is fed into the database to check whether that person or any of the details which are mentioned in the ST message are on record with us. It could be so that either Nigeria itself or in some other country have reported something to us. There are some details which are in this message. And then the role played by Interpol would be we immediately contact the, the sender and we say this man is on record or this telephone number is in record and it has been sent to us by this particular country and we then speak to the country that sent us originally the, the, the details and we get these two countries, let's say Nigeria and let's say United States, to come in together. Oh yeah, you see, I, I asked this question because um, apart from the trafficking, um, back home we, we, we seem to have a lot of our youths getting involved in the usage these are undergraduates and some young school leavers and this has kind of influenced their attitude, their behavior into getting into serious violent crimes, which of course has a lot of effects on our society. Now what we're asking is, what I'm trying to find out from you, is there, is there anything the Interpol do to assist the member um, uh, nations by way of reducing uh, the, the intake of uh, heroin, for example, in our locality? Basically, <coughs> Interpol has, what it has been doing is more of action on the supply reduction side. And the demand reduction is being started now. So it is now, what, what you mentioned, involves demand reduction as well as uh, supply reduction. Supply reduction, yes, Interpol is doing by way of 
by way of uh, cooperating with the other member countries, by way of training sessions, uh, by way of you know conferences and uh, on uh, ongoing investigations, which of course are more on the supply reduction side, where the abuses of of illicit drugs are concerned, uh, we have to concentrate more on uh, on the demand reduction by, of course, mainly through education. And that, I believe, is an area where Interpol will be actively involved in, in, in the future. Okay. Yeah, I um, would like you to share experiences with us uh, as an expert in this field. You would have come across some issues. i give you an example. Some few months back in our studio, we had a man who was convicted and he claims to be a baron. And he also told us how he lures young men and women into trafficking innocently by way of giving them gifts or promising to take them abroad and actually for abusing them as courier. Do you have such experiences that you think you want to share with our viewers? Yes. Uh, now, couriers, as I mentioned earlier, most of them, I would say, they had some knowledge or they would have had some suspicion on the fact that uh, they were doing something illegal. Because if they were pro pro promised a holiday, why are they being promised a holiday? If they are given gifts to carry or given gifts for their own use, why are they being given gifts like this? But I would say that some of the individuals or groups that are being sought after by traffickers are where illegal immigration is concerned. Now the person who wants to go to another country illegally is disparate and he will be given something to carry. And another group that has been targeted in the past were, you know, were these uh, groups from, especially from, from the, the countries in Africa, the church mission groups, where they go to different countries on, uh, on religious activities. And another group would be entertainers or cultural exchange groups which could be targeted. And uh, of course, as I said earlier, in most instances, uh, the courier should have had some suspicion that, uh, that uh, he or she is doing something illegal. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have barons. We've made to, we, we, we're made to understand there are barons. Of course, if there are no barons, there will be trafficking and there won't be uh, consumption of it. Now, at this level, at the Interpol level, which of course is a respected body internationally all over the world, one would have expected that you would have sent out your uh, drag net, uh, nets to ensure that these barons are brought to book, or at least, no, if not totally eradicated, brought to the barest minimum. What has the Interpol done in that regard? It is one thing should be made clear that Interpol, I'm talking about drug trafficking activities, okay? Yeah. I'll confine myself to that. Interpol or the drug subdirectorate, we rely or depend on the member countries to send us the details and the facts because it's uh, the, mem the, the member country that does the arrest. Yeah. And we have to depend on that particular member country for all the relevant details so that we could diffuse it to the other, other member countries. So that's where the initial step is, or where the initial step lies. So it is a detecting country that has to give, feed us the information. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we 
give it to other countries and then from there onwards work it up in such a way and if for example now if if there was a let's say a sri lankan national arrested in in nigeria for drug trafficking then immediately we get to know from nigeria we mention to sri lanka all right the sri lankan national has been arrested or like you asked if the person arrested says that uh, this drug was given to me by this man living in sri lanka then we immediately liaise with sri lanka and tell them okay this man's name has transpired in this particular detection so please liaise with uh, with uh, interpol uh, lagos and keep us informed what is happening and then we intervene and assist both countries yeah what i'm trying to find out is this um, there are countries that may not want to fight you maybe because they benefit immensely from what their citizens prof- um, bring in there are countries that are willing to fight it to the very minimum do you do you stand as a pressure organization to ensure that each of these countries um adhere strictly to the international rule by by making sure that such citizens of their countries that are involved or that are being sought after by another country is um is made to face the the law for example i give you example some three months back american government came into nigeria and got some nigerians down to america to to face the law and now because i think because nigeria is willing to fight such a crime they were able to expedite expedite action by ensuring that such people were taken out of nigeria now do you have a country in a situation where a country does not say anything wrong and is not willing to cooperate in that regard is the interpol seen as a pressure group by ensure by making sure that the other country um um brings their own citizen to book no there is interpol is not in a situation to apply pressure okay. but interpol will take action to see that certain steps are taken for example issuing of international warrants the processes like that interpol will certainly do but then uh, applying pressure to arrest a man or for extradition or it will, it will depend on that particular country thank you okay I, i'd like to change uh, my how it relates to africa africa yes on that uh, on those lines uh, I would uh, I think it would be easier to to uh, speak something on west african trafficking groups okay. so that it involves as you asked of uh, africa itself mm-hmm. uh africa per se I'm confining myself to heroin and uh, and uh, cocaine okay africa is not a producing country and of course now it has become a consuming country and basically africa is a transit country so what the west african trafficking groups are doing is most of the drugs the heroin chiefly comes from south west asia and also from south east asia and uh, the cocaine from colombia and peru and from brazil what the west african trafficking groups have done is they are entrenched in countries in these regions for example there will be a big community of west african nationals especially nigerians and the people from ghana in thailand in uh, mainly in bangkok then in pakistan and going on to the other side there is a big community 
in South America. In Brazil, there's a big community of, uh, of uh, West African nationals. And of course, in the United States, especially in Chicago area, and also in Russia. So you can see that the traffickers or the trafficking groups have established themselves in these areas and they can make use of couriers from these countries itself so that there's no, not much of suspicion. Let's say a student, a student being asked to take some drugs. And uh, it's interesting to see, see that in, uh, in uh, how these uh, uh, groups operate in, uh, in the 1990s, 80 to 90 percent of the couriers arrested in the airports in Pakistan were connected or controlled by Nigerian trafficking groups. And West African tra trafficking groups, according to experts, they operate or they have firmly established themselves as communities at least in 80 countries in the world. So there's a very good network which, uh, which assists these groups to do the uh, trafficking. And of course, using Africa as the depot so to speak and uh, with direct airline uh, services from many parts of the world to Africa it uh, the traffickers are making use of that uh, of that facility and uh, apart from the couriers one has to be conscious of the fact that uh, the trafficking groups are also making use of the airmail services and the express delivery services. And of course, increasingly in our air freight and in containers too. Yeah. Oh, so they shift, they shift their focus to using um, container services, air freight, as to using human beings. Yes. Is it because because of the tight security nature at the airport? Yes, it's, uh, yes. Most of the countries are aware as to how the trafficking is done, so they concentrate their efforts on, uh, on certain issues. But still, one uh, aspect or one uh, method that is being still used is the swallowing of drugs by couriers. And uh, it still goes on. Still goes on. Yeah, thank you. N now, I would like you to share experiences, like we said, so that our young ones back home will learn lessons from it. You have, like you said, students, they innocently get involved, and uh, the onus is on them to prove if they're actually innocent. Young girls get carried away because of one money, what, what, whatever that the man would have promised her get involved in it. Like you also said, it's a lot for them to prove they're innocent. So we'd like you to share experiences in that regard where you, have, you find young girls and boys getting involved in it. Yes, I, I, the, my, my advice would be to be conscious of the fact that, that if something is offered, why is it being offered? Let's say airline ticket, okay, for a holiday. Airline ticket itself, all right. But then, is that person asked to carry something apart from the ticket? Is that young person given clothes or a suitcase? It could, it could, it could, it not necessarily mean a gift. Let's say for a travel, one needs a suitcase, and it could uh, be an uh, an empty suitcase, but. The fact is, uh, there are now the one common method now is to impregnate the drug onto the cover of the suitcase. So there is nothing in the suitcase. There is no parcel in the suitcase. Or the heroin or the cocaine could be 
inserted between the sides of uh, of the of the travel bag or the suitcase and uh, i know in for example in pakistan one could give a consignment of heroin let's say 2 kilos of heroin to a person who who is in the trade of making suitcases and ask him to build a suitcase so that the heroin is inside so uh, one has to be very careful what, what one when we when we think or when we speak about being given something we always think it could be a gift like a pair of shoes or you know but even clothes for example now they make clothes they make and they, they will make a coat with uh, with all it's made of heroin yeah there was there's this um the impregnation yeah pictures of um, this thing you sent to nigeria interpol yes where you have both things Yes. Ah, yes, that is a, now a common method coming from Bangkok. Yes, that is in, in, in clothes, the buttons are made of uh, of heroin. Yes, but in the clothes, the, the, the garment per se, it has uh, the, the drug impregnated. And then they, they boil it and take the heroin out. So one has to be very, very careful of, uh, one is, of what one is offered. Thank you. And um, do you have any other thing you want to share generally that we haven't talked about that you think um, should members of the public should um, know about? Yes, I think, uh, of course, members of the public, one way they can you know, assist the law enforcement officers is, is by informing certain things. Most law enforcement agencies in respective countries depend on the members of the public for information. That's for sure. So, you know, law-abiding citizens could always, you know, provide some information about drug trafficking because there will be indications about a person who was not having money, let's say five or six months ago, suddenly having money. How does it happen? Buying a car, buying a house with the no visible means of income. So the, the, the public, uh, some members of the public are aware. So uh, we depend a lot, law enforcement agencies, on, on information from the general public, that's for sure. And uh, of course, uh, about you mentioned about the problem of, of uh, abuse. That, according to my experience, I think uh, the abuse should be first controlled by the parents. They have to keep an eye on the on the young people at home, and that and there will be some uh, some uh, indications on you know where the child cannot hide the fact that, uh, okay, the, for example, if he's not eating properly, not sleeping properly, you know, not, uh, not his normal self, then uh, something is wrong. Loss of appetite, you know, things like that. And if, if he has been interested in sports, if he suddenly you know, stops uh, sport, why? So the parents have to be uh, you know, very, very alert to this uh, problem and of course uh, they should be aware as to what what is the child doing uh, where is he going with whom uh, uh, does he move around thank you very much appreciate it you're welcome yeah. all right promo take one on drugs uh, go ahead a bit of advice say no to drugs and this applies to you, the young people. Say no to drugs if somebody offers you some drugs to experiment. Say no to drugs if somebody asks you to hand over the drugs to some other person. And also say no to drugs if you are just invited to a party where you know that there will be drugs passed around. Then another bit of advice, 
if you happen to travel out of your country for any purpose be aware of any gift or parcel that will be given to you by a person to carry it to your visiting country and uh, to you parents please keep an eye on the children it need not be or it should, it should not be a very strict eye but it should be a very careful and caring eye and uh, least and not the last and not the least be mindful of the repercussions of trafficking in drugs and also of drug abuse trafficking in drugs in every country there is stringent stringent laws and punishment and your families are going to suffer and drug abuse it is not only the person who takes the drug who suffers it is the entire family first and then of course the community thank you thank, thank you for all right go ahead good afternoon good afternoon i'd like you to introduce yourself My name is Doug Wiggs. Uh I'm with Interpol in Lyon, France. I head up the notices branch uh here at Interpol. Um what is Interpol? Well, Interpol is an organization of uh the police community. Uh it began in around 1923 uh when uh, the police community in Europe was experiencing a a problem with uh criminals crossing uh frontiers from one country into another and they weren't able to uh, track them down as easily as they they would in their own country so a group of law enforcement professionals uh back at the turn of the century started proposing this idea and it it really didn't get off the ground till about 1923 uh and today we now have 178 member countries uh that are involved in Interpol. Interpol is not like a lot of people think where uh, we have special agents that uh work for Interpol and go over the world making investigations. Uh Interpol is made up of police officers from the member countries uh working together uh to to help one another. Uh my parent agency is the US Marshal Service uh which is one of the federal police agencies from the United States. Uh we are a little older than Interpol. We date back to 1789. Uh one of our chief responsibilities has always been uh since George Washington appointed the first 13 marshals uh to look for fugitives, federal fugitives in the United States. Uh with the modern world, uh those fugitives can be anywhere. Uh they can can flee to Europe, flee to Africa, Australia, and we need an organization like Interpol uh to help us with that matter because we do not have the resources to send deputy US marshals all over the world uh just to track down fugitives. It's too expensive. But with uh Interpol and the assistance it gives agencies like mine, uh we have a much better chance of finding uh fugitives finding missing persons uh helping to identify uh persons that uh, have been discovered uh, dead bodies and things like that it, yeah. it's a very good organization for that i want to know it down sir how it relates to africa africa yes on that uh on those lines uh, i would uh, i think it would be easier to to uh, speak something on west african trafficking groups okay. so that it involves that you asked of uh, africa itself mm-hmm. uh africa per se i'm confining myself to heroin and uh, and uh, cocaine okay africa 
is not a producing country. And of course now it has become a consuming country. And basically Africa is a transit country. So what the West African trafficking groups are doing is most of the drugs, the heroin chiefly comes from South West Asia and also from Southeast Asia. And uh, the cocaine from Colombia and Peru and from Brazil. What the West African trafficking groups have done is they are entrenched in countries in these regions. For example, there will be a big community of West African nationals, especially Nigerians and the people from Ghana in Thailand, in, uh, mainly in Bangkok, then in Pakistan. And going on to the other side, there is a big community in South America. In Brazil, there's a big community of, uh, of uh, West African nationals. And of course, in the United States, especially in Chicago area, and also in Russia. So you can see that the traffickers or the trafficking groups have established themselves in these areas, and they can make use of couriers from these countries itself, so that there's no, not much of suspicion, let's say a student, a student being asked to take some drugs. And uh, it's interesting to see, see that in, uh, in uh, how these uh, uh, groups operate in, uh, in the 1990s, 80 to 90 percent of the couriers arrested in the airports in Pakistan were connected or controlled by Nigerian trafficking groups. And West African tra trafficking groups, according to experts, they operate or they have firmly established themselves as communities at least in 80 countries in the world. So there's a very good network which, uh, which assists these groups to do the uh, trafficking. And of course, using Africa as the depot, so to speak. And uh, with direct airline uh, services from many parts of the world to Africa, it, uh, the traffickers are making use of that, uh, of that facility. And uh, apart from the couriers, one has to be conscious of the fact that uh, the trafficking groups are also making use of the airmail services and the express delivery services. And of course, increasingly in our air freight and in containers too. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so the, 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 the shift, they shift their focus to using um, container services, air freights, as to using human beings. Yes. Is it because they, because of the tight security nature at the airport? Because of the yes, it's uh, yes. Because most of the countries are aware as to how the trafficking is done, so they concentrate their efforts on uh, on certain issues. But still, one uh, aspect or one uh, method that is being still used is the swallowing of drugs by couriers and uh, it still goes on, it still goes on. Yeah, thank you. N now, I would like you to share experiences, like we said, so that our young ones back home will learn lessons from it. We have, like you said, students, they innocently get involved and uh, the onus is on them to prove if they're actually innocent. Young girls get carried away because of one money, whatever, whatever that the man would have promised her, get involved in it. Like you also said, 
it's not for them to prove their innocence. So we'd like you to share experiences in that regard where you, have, you find young girls and boys getting involved in it. Yes, I, I, the, my, my advice would be to be conscious of the fact that, that if something is offered, why is it being offered? Let's say airline ticket, okay, for holiday. Airline ticket itself, all right. But then, is that person asked to carry something apart from the ticket? Is that young person given clothes or a suitcase? It could, it could, it could, it not necessarily mean a gift. Let's say for a travel, one needs a suitcase, and it could uh, be an uh, an empty suitcase. But the fact is, uh, there are now. The one common method now is to impregnate the drug onto the cover of the suitcase. So there is nothing in the suitcase. There is no parcel in the suitcase. Or the heroin or the cocaine could be inserted between the sides of, uh, of, the, of the travel bag or the suitcase. And uh, I know, in, for example, in Pakistan, one could give a consignment of heroin, let's say two kilos of heroin, to a person who, who is in the trade of making suitcases and ask him to build a suitcase so that the heroin is inside. So uh, one has to be very careful what, what, when, we, when we think or when we speak about being given something, we always think it could be a gift, like a pair of shoes or, you know, even clothes, for example, now they make clothes. They make and they, they will make a coat with uh, with all. It's made of heroin. Yeah, there was there's this. Um, the impregnation. Yeah, pictures of um, this thing you sent to Nigeria, Interpol. Yes. Where you have both names. Yes. Ah, uh, oh, yes, that is a now of a common method coming from Bangkok. Yes, that is in, in, in clothes. The buttons are made of uh, of heroin. Yes, but in the clothes, the 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 garment per se. It has uh, the, the drug impregnated, and then they, they boil it and take the heroin out. So one has to be very, very careful of, uh, one is, of what one is offered. Thank you. And um, do you have any other thing you want to share generally that we haven't talked about that you think um, should members of the public should um, know about? Yes, I think, uh, of course, Members of the public, one way they can you know, assist the law enforcement officers is, is by informing certain things. You know, m most law enforcement agencies in respective countries depend on the members of the public for information, that's for sure. So, you know, law abiding citizens could always you know, provide some information about drug trafficking because there will be indications about a person who was not having money let's say five or six months ago suddenly having money how does it happen buying a car buying a house with the no visible means of income so the, the, the public uh, some members of the public are aware so we depend a lot, law enforcement agencies, on on information from the general public, that's for sure. And uh, of course, uh, about you mentioned about the problem of, of uh, abuse. That, according to my experience, I think uh, the abuse should be first controlled by the parents. They have to keep an eye on the, on the young people at home. And there, and there will be some, uh, some uh, indications on, you know, where the child cannot hide the fact that, uh, okay, the, for example, if he's not eating properly, not sleeping properly, you know, not, uh, not his normal self, then uh, something is wrong loss of appetite and things like that. And if 
if he had been interested in sports, if he suddenly you know, stops uh, sport, why? So the parents have to be uh, you know, very, very alert to this uh, problem and of course uh, they should be aware as to what, what is the child doing, where is he going, with whom uh, does he move around. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, welcome. Yeah. All right, promo take one on drugs. Uh, go ahead. A bit of advice. Say no to drugs. 